hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Praise the Lord. And in vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. Teaching us doctrines, their cultures of tribes. Teaching us doctrines, their selfish and wicked greed-based doctrines. But let's look at what verse 13 says. Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be what? Uprooted. That goes for every apostate church in the whole world today. Note it that my Lord and Savior says, if he didn't plant you, you'll be uprooted. Praise the Lord. Next item. God raised faithful witnesses. In the midst of that anomaly, in the midst of that great apostasy wars and rumors of wars in Europe, God still raised faithful witnesses. God will always have faithful witnesses. In the midst of the syncretism, because that's what all the churches now in Europe and uh, wherever we are practicing. And evils like slavery being justified. God continued to raise faithful witnesses between 1600 and 1900. These witnesses hungered and cried for the spirit outpouring. They cried and prayed for a revival that could liken Pentecost. And God did answer their cries and prayers from time to time. If you read the church history, you see there were revivals that took place, but there were many revivals. They will not be compared to what God was about to do in Azusa in Los Angeles, praise the Lord. What am I trying to say? Azusa in Los Angeles was as a result of the cries and prayers of saints from 16th century going on to 19th century. The cries for the Holy Spirit to come down again like he did on the day of first, the first Pentecost. Praise the Lord. The 1906 Azusa Street Revival. Praise the Lord. I would like you, those of you who have been following, to recall some of the things we said when we introduced this series. The Holy Spirit help our teacher and guide on the 24th of January. We said some of things like this. God raised his banner in Azusa, Los Angeles, California, in the United States of America in 1906. When the Holy Spirit enveloped what we call a transgressive gathering of believers. Transgressive means they were really against what ought to be happening. You are, you are, I will explain as I go on. Why did God choose that gathering of believers and not those in other places in the United States of America or for that matter in any other country in the world? To answer that question, we have to understand the state of play in the early 20th century United States of America. America had just finished fighting a civil war. And in that civil war, even though the claim is state's right, it was actually slave war. Those who wanted to continue to keep human beings enslaved, including some of the churches, organizations from tribal Europe that have now invaded America, stood in the land of the natives, and are now owning the lands, and now imported slaves from Africa, millions, to be what? Like horses. We felt they were treated worse than horses. That's the state of play in early 20th century United States of America. Why I say this is because I will assert at some future teaching that that state of play continues even till today and will be one of the things that will bring the end of the world. Overt racism was rife and segregation of people on the basis of their skin tone was the of the day especially in the southern states of the United States of America.
doesn't look like Caucasians. As if you didn't come from Europe looking like Caucasians. You could be born to life on the merest accusation. Like a little African boy talking to a Caucasian female. Even saying good morning, it could be enough and you are dead. Some of those racist hate groups in the southern United States, like the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan, were using the name of the Lord as they committed these atrocities. Places of gathering of believers were segregated in the southern states of the United States of America. That means if I walk in there, I cannot enter. The, if, I, if even I'm allowed near the basement, underground there, it will be use a bathroom that the Caucasians don't use. Reserved only for what? People of my color. Please note something. Caucasians, including those who claim to be Christians, are the originators of racism. They are the implementers of segregationist policies. It happened in South Africa, in fact, it's all over the world. They taught the rest of the world the different hues of the skin. <clears throat> Black, dark, brown, whatever. And they claimed white as their color. Nobody's white. They fought that Christ, they f they, sorry, they forgot that Christ died on the cross. He brought grace for all of us. There's no Jew or Gentile. There's no black, there's no brown, there's no other colors. For them, those with dark skins were less than women. That's why they made them slaves and treated them worse than their animals. In 1906, California was one of the few states where people of all skin tones could gather together to worship God. That's why I said it was a transgressive gathering. They would have been transgressive in other states, but in California, that was unallowed. I believe that God, who is God, made a statement to the racists and the supremacists who claim to be his followers, but were acting contrary to his teachings. That's why he came down that, you know, they'll be crying for revival. The slave owners, they wanted if everybody else was crying for revival. But yet, they were committing heinous crimes. Raping the little girls, whom some of them could even be their, some of their, you know, children. Yes, that's happened. This is history. I'm not quoting anything that is wrong. I'm here to speak truth to everybody, including myself. The Azusa Street Revival was made by people, by of all people. See, see, that's why, God, I love you. You are God. Lord Jesus, thank you. Of four people, a one-eyed, one eye, only one eye, 35 year old African American. See, see, a son of free slaves named William Simon. Tell me why God is not God. God made a statement that had been crying for revival for 300, 400 years. And when he came, he used the lowest of the low in their minds to propel the greatest revival since the first Pentecost. I want everybody to know those who claim they are Pentecostals. Because next Sunday I'm going to come hard on you who say you're Pentecostal. Because I will claim that most of you are apostate Pentecostals. You are not Pentecostals. You are false Pentecostals. Because if you are not following the steps of Azusa Street Revival, you are a false Pentecostal. And that is my major issue next Sunday. Tune in and watch and listen. The Azusa Street Revival was led by four people, one-eyed. Oh my God, thank you, Jesus. Yes, African-American, a son of free slaves, named who? William Sibon. He had come from Texas on invitation to preach at a church in Los Angeles. During his first sermon, he preached that speaking in tongues was the first biblical evidence of the inevitable infilling of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know what happened? The following Sunday, which was March 4 of 1906, he returned to the church and found that the church had padlocked the door so he didn't get any entrance. You can't stop God. 
Next reading, please. From Wikipedia. On the night of April 9th, 1906, Seymour and seven men were waiting on God on Bonnie Bray Street when suddenly, as though hit by a bolt of lightning, they were knocked from their chairs to the floor and the other seven men began to speak in tongues and shout out loud, praising God. The news quickly spread. The city was stirred. Crowds gathered. And a few days later, Simon himself received the Holy Spirit. Services were moved outside to accommodate the crowds who came from all around. People fell down under the power of God as they approached. People were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the sick were healed, and sinners received salvation. Praise the Lord. What you heard is self-explanatory. As the crowds grew in that place, they moved to an old dilapidated two-story frame building at 312 Azusa Street. That's why Azusa Street Revival. In the industrial section. <laughs> Do you know what this building was being used for? It was a place they used to keep horses. So you can be sure the smell of you know horse excrements were all over the place. That was the only place they could go. Compared to when the Lord was born in a manger. And it was in this place that a continuous three-year revival occurred. This revival came to be known around the world as the Azusa Street Revival. Contrast the atmosphere in Azusa Street, a lively stable for horses, used for horses before. With the carnivals you see in your churches today. Yes! The globe-trotting, jet-owning pastors and leaders. Compare it with what you see today, the bands, everything. And you say you want the Holy Spirit to come. No, you will not come there. He didn't come in the first time when the Lord Jesus Christ came down. He went to the manger. When the first Pentecost happened, happened in the upper room where the apostles were hiding. And I'm sure it was not in the best part of town in Jerusalem. And when it happened again in Azusa, look at where it took place. You know what happened in those places people are clamoring for? Because God is God. Next reading, please. From Wikipedia again. Stanley H. Fresham, in his book, With Signs Following, quotes an eyewitness description of the scene. The revival was characterized by spiritual experiences accompanied with testimonies of physical healing miracles, worship services, and speaking in tongues. The participants were criticized by some secular media and Christian theologians for behaviors considered to be outrageous and unorthodox, especially at the time. Praise the Lord. Note that speaking in tongues is a gift for spiritual empowerment. Contrary to teachings that say this first evangelism, meaning if you're not speaking a language, somebody else will understand. It is not, uh, you know, tongues. And note what happened again. Christians from many traditions mocked the early 20th century Pentecostals. Because that's what they came to be known. Unlike today, where the so-called Pentecostals are celebrated all over the world. They claimed that the movement was hyper-emotional, misused scriptures, and lost focus on Christ by overemphasizing the Holy Spirit. Hypocrites. Some ministers even warned their congregations to stay away from the Azusa Street Mission to almost every type of church are embracing, claiming that Pentecostals one word the other, but they're not. Let's scripture, please. I read from Acts chapter 2, verses 13 to 18. Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. 
But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Praise the Lord. Hear me well. Note that last scripture we read. We've been saying some things about it before. Because if you desire spirit baptism, pay attention now because you can receive even as we are speaking now. Because I'm going to conclude this sermon by saying the following. Everything we do, you and I, if we say we're believers, must be about Jesus and his mission. Everything we do or say. And if you desire spirit baptism, if you have not been baptized in the spirit, which you must be baptized, 